I've been here for about six months now, and when I try to present my country, I get two things. So it's a wonderful place to spend a holiday, which is true, and second is the stamp, the Blue Mauritius, and sometimes I hear about the dodo, but there's very little to tell us about the, how Mauritius evolved, where it started, what are we doing now, from independence, which is not so long ago, 1968, right in the middle of the Cold War, um, we don't know very much about it, and we're also very small. So I thought, let me show you this film, then you know what it is about. If you want to come and spend a holiday, you know what's waiting for you. We are very good. But what I would like to do now, since this theme is about power, I would like to talk to you about what my country was doing during this time as a small island in the Indian Ocean. Now, since you've seen what it looks like, these are just a few figures I want to show you. 2,400 kilometers southeast coast of Africa. I will show you a map later on. The capital, Port Louis. We only have 1.2 million people on the island and a workforce of 541. As you can see, the, we speak quite a few languages. We have a good climate. And uh, what's not on here, we have a population which is made up of very many different cultures. Um, how do I change this? Just, just press here? Yeah. Oh, all right. Just a few indicators to give you an idea about what Mersh is about in figures now. And what we do. I should say at that point that we started off as a monocrop during the colonial times. Sugarcane was introduced and was encouraged. It means that we were, for a long time, totally re reliant on sugar as an export. So we had to diversify if we wanted to survive, and we did, into tourism, into manufacture. We were at one time um, a very well-known manufacturer in, uh, in garments. Unfortunately, it's less now with the new competition coming up. To tell you that a small island sometimes, distance doesn't make any difference. We, some 15 years ago, we were the third biggest uh, manufacturers of ski gloves, which is very funny an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, being the third producer of ski gloves for Europe and other countries, which gives you an idea that if you have enough vision, there's, there's no limit to what you can do to survive and to thrive. At that point, I'd like to tell you that in 1961, around, Nobel Prize winner James Mead predicted that Mauritius, if it got its independence, was bound to fail as a state, as a sovereign state. We are a sovereign state now since 1968. And we did not only did not fail, but we are one of the most successful countries in the region of Africa and in the um, Indian Ocean. Which means that there are certain factors that were Mr. Mead perhaps did not see, but we managed and we thrived. So let me go on. Where we are, it's high time I told you where we are. <laughs> mm. We are just that tiny dot that you can see here in the Indian Ocean. That's all. It's very small. Has any of you been there by any chance? See, I knew I'd meet someone. I knew I'd meet someone who's been there. I'm always meeting on a holiday? Uh, work holiday. Work holiday. So you can contradict if I'm not telling the truth, OK? <laughs> now, our story is linked with the story of the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is the third biggest. It's also the world's, it's also where the world's earliest civilization were Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt, the Indian subcontinent. It is a far calmer ocean. It's very seldom said. It's calmer and therefore more open to trade. It opened to trade earlier than the Atlantic or the Pacific. The powerful monsoons also meant that the ships could make use of the winds to reach India and go back. This allowed, for example, Indonesian peoples to cross the Indian Oceans and populate Madagascar. 
And you can see what a distance this is to, from Indonesia to Madagascar. It's all thanks to the monsoon winds, that, that some part of the year blows in one direction, the other part of the year blows in the other direction, so that you can go back. So the earliest known maritime trade between Mesopotamia and Indus Valley was conducted along the Indian Ocean. The important Silk Road, this is an older map. The red lines here show you the Silk Road, which I'm sure you've heard about, and the spice trade, which went along the blue lines. Now, what happened is that around 1453, this route, the way it was going, was blocked by the Ottoman Empire. This is what the started the Age of Discovery. This is when the other way around Africa was explored, round the Cape of Good Hope, and this is at the time where we came in. Mauritius was on the way to India and to all these, the, the, the west part of the, the east part, sorry, of the Indian Ocean. Now Mauritius, as we see, saw before, it's got a good climate. It has a good soil. There's plenty of food. So obvious, and it had a very good harbor uh, compared to the other islands in this region, which made Mauritius the ideal harbor to stop on the way to India and to the other countries on the eastern, eastern part of the Indian Ocean. This is how Mauritius got its importance. At this point, I might say that Mauritius was discovered by the Arabs in 1975, in 975, sorry. The Portuguese in the 15th, 16th century. The Dutch were also at the end of Danish were there at the beginning of the 17th century. But our story really started when the French took over Mauritius because they, wa they wanted to control the Indian Ocean, therefore trade, which we see that a lot of wars have been fought over Mauritius for its position in the Indian Ocean. The French took over Mauritius, and from there, it was not only because of the trade, but also to pester the other. It was a lot of piracy at that time, and also to direct uh, naval attacks on other ships in the regions, um, among others, of course, especially the British, who were very strong at the time, very strongly competing for influence in, in India. So this, we can see that trade played a big role. This is where the India companies started. The Dutch East India Company, which was formed at the beginning of the 17th century, with its headquarters in Batavia, and the French East Indian Company, which was founded in 1664, but which had to, to wind up for several reasons, uh, internal reasons they had to wind up. Now, the French East, uh, East India Company was, interestingly enough, uh, initiated by Colbert, one of the advisors of Louis XIV at the time, and it, because it wanted a share in the African slave trade, which was thriving uh, in the area at the moment. It was competing for Britain, for India against Britain. At the time, if La Bourdonnais, a governor of Mauritius at the time, had succeeded, the India could well have been French and not Indian. He conducted some very successful uh, attacks with uh, maritime, of course, naval attacks on India, but unfortunately, uh, did not his uh, superior did not agree with him over Madras. He took over Madras, which is now Chennai, and uh, he actually wanted to use Madras uh, for a ransom, and his superior wanted to erase Madras from the map. So this lack of understanding between the two um, resulted in La Bourdonnais being sent back to France. So at the end of the day, the British took over India, as we all know, and Mauritius stayed French at the time. Between 1967 and 1980, Port Louis became an important center for trade, naval operations, as I, as I was saying. During the Seven World Wars, 1756 to 1763, 
France and England battled over control of the Indian Ocean, over trade with India, and control over India itself. Oh, I should be at that point talking about the dodo you have heard about, which was uh, um, an animal you could only find in Mauritius and uh, unfortunately now extinct. Whether it was eaten up, but I think it also has a lot to do with other animal species which were introduced into Mauritius, which ate up their eggs. They were flightless birds, so quite vulnerable. Now, we are talking about power, we're talking about hard power, soft power, smart power, uh, diplomacy. That all this can only start if you are if you are a sovereign state. You cannot have diplomacy. You cannot talk about diplomacy in a country if you are not sovereign. Mauritius only became sovereign in 1968, and as I was saying before, it was in the middle of a Cold War. We were a small country, a poor country, and we it seemed that we were we were bound to to, to die, to not to not to survive in the circumstances. But we did. When did we start to have a Mauritian way of thinking? When did we become Mauritian? Because, you see, there were when the French or the Dutch or anyone came there, Mauritius was not inhabited. We do not have an endeavor, well, people who lived on Mauritius all the time. When they came, Mauritius was empty. All it had was the dodo and a wonderful fauna and flora, part of which is not existent anymore. The French Revolution played a great role, funnily enough, in uh, the uh, being Mauritian consciousness. And it went over disagreement over the slave trade. The attempt in 1796 for the French to implement the decree for abolition of slavery by two agents sent to Mauritius, it failed. They were sent back to Mauritius because the colonists on Mauritius needed slavery to thrive. So from France, two agents came to Mauritius to implement the abolition of slavery. The two agents were sent back. Later on, when Mauritius became English, 1810, the English took over Mauritius. The English also sent an attorney general, Sir Jeremy, to implement abolition of slavery. He was also ill-received and sent back, which means that Mauritius, all of a sudden, was not part of France was not willing to agree to everything that the king was saying or that Napoleon was saying, was beginning to develop its own consciousness as a country. Slavery was eventually abolished in 1835, but not without the owners receiving compensation from the British. To tell you that a lot of it is trade, commerce, is probably what is guiding our societies nowadays. So 1935, Slavery was abolished, the slaves were free, most of them wandered off to the coasts of Mauritius, which you have just seen, where fish were plentiful, most of them became fishermen. And to replace them, this is when the English uh, took indentured labor from India to work on the fields. Our history is no more than 450 years old. We have no, as I said, no indigenous inhabitants, We've had continuous waves of colonization and settlement. We have no ancient writings, we have no religious texts or myths except those that were brought with the people when they came to us, either as slaves, as traders, as indentured labor. This is no what now forms part of the population of Mauritius. This system of slavery severed millions of people from their roots and it ultimately gave rise to new societies. New oral traditions developed throughout the period of slavery, which gave rise, for example, in Mauritius to Creole, which is also understood in Seychelles, in Guadeloupe. Those are languages, I should say, which have developed independently between, which is a middle thing between the French colonialists and the African slaves. Well, as I was saying, the 
societies, ethnic groups, and their rules were torn apart at the time by slavery. But maybe, in a way, in a small place like Mauritius, it uh, made a society concrete faster than it would normally have been. To give you an idea, I mean, we all know what happened in Africa. The boundaries and frontiers that you see in Africa are all man-made. goes across ethnic groups, cultures. My, my friend here would know from DRC Congo would know something about it. You have the same people living on two sides of the border, which makes it extremely difficult to govern a country in Africa because the frontiers are not natural frontiers, have nothing to do with the culture and society and societies which have been thriving there for a long time. So in comparison, I would say Mauritius had a very effective frontier. It was the sea. The sea is perhaps, together with the desert, one of the, of the most difficult frontiers, or perhaps the safest frontiers that you can have, which the countries, many countries in Africa today do not have. A fluid frontier, which is the cause for a lot of wars and, um, and uh, conflicts. But in our case, the ocean also was not only a frontier, but also uh, on the way for communication, which was on the right path to communication for trade. Mm, what you see now, I thought I might show you. You've seen um, what Mauritius looks like now. We have some old photographs to tell you what Port Louis looked like in, this in the 18th century and what it looks like now. We have a port which has a tremendous development uh, in the last few years because we had to capitalize on what we have, which means uh, trade being on the way for the fishing ships in uh, uh, fishing boats or fishing ships in the Indian Ocean, which come and uh, deliver the fish in Mauritius on the way to other countries. It is being uh, worked on, added value, put on in Mauritius, and then further exported. Uh, this has developed our port facilities uh, very much in the last years. Again, I will go quickly over that. We are in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and uh, the connectivity is very good, as you can see. Flights to India, to Singapore, to Europe. We have daily flights to Europe several direct flights to Europe as well, flights to Dubai and flights to South Africa, and links to all major ports. To show you just quickly how, for example, the uh, foreign direct investment has developed from only 2006 to, to 2008, uh, the difference has been great. For example, from the UK, from 3,821 to 2,000, 2000 oh no, no, sorry, and to 2 million 44 rupees, which is uh, quite a big development. We have nowadays business opportunities in very many sectors. We're from a monocrop sugar culture island, we have become a financial platform for BPO, for many other things, as you can see here, creative and media, knowledge, logistic. There is a lot being done for Mauritius to become a knowledge hub in the area, seafood processing. So these are all the, the regions, the, the, the spheres, where a lot is being invested in Mauritius. To show you again the Indian Ocean, which is a bit more, uh, it's, a, it's a newer map, just to show you where we are. And um, where Mauritius is, we have, just to show you the area, we have a very big, we are very small, but we have a very big maritime area which covers something like two million uh, square kilometer, which is of course not easy for Mauritius to manage. Mauritius has not, does not have an army. So when, uh, when Mr. Dontrid was talking to me about soft power, <laughs> hard power, I thought, oh my God, I only have soft power. We don't have an army. I mean, <laughs> we have uh, something like ten to fifteen thousand policemen. So we are thri we thrive on soft power. 
To tell you a little bit about that, when we became independent in 1968, we were a poor country. Our prime minister, at the time, you must remember, it was a small island. We didn't have internet. We didn't have the communication, the information that everybody has access to nowadays through the internet was not there. So diplomacy had to be conducted primarily by our people, some of our people who had been to study, who had contacts. So when it came to taking decisions, of course, we could not have the capacity like big countries, of the big, bigger countries. We really had to have some sort of vision and a bit gut feeling. For example, we have a diaspora which is very strong. So there was something that had to be done there. We cultured good relationship with India, with China, and with all the countries, of course, with Africa, because some of our population is African, which means that we are in the middle of cultures where we are. So we had to make use of it. We had good relationships with France, good relationships with India, good relationships with China at the time, uh, instead of recognizing, at the time it was called Formosa, Taiwan, our prime minister decided he was going to recognize China, probably guided by our Chinese diaspora. So um, Mauritius was, is a, was, was, um, had to take decisions with very little to help at the time. But the right decisions were taken, for example, with the help of many countries, I must say, because without help, it was impossible for the small island to do it. Um, we became what I showed you before. But I need to say that, like many African countries, Mauritius does not have the capacity of other countries. I will take the, the example even here in Berlin. Um, I have one secretary. I have one first secretary. I have a confidential three secretary someone to look after the consular, that's it. We are small and we can only function if we function together, which is why we need to build alliances. We all need to work together on that one. We are part of several, many organizations like the African Union, which I'm sure you've all heard about, uh, which concludes which of some 54 African countries belong to it. It was established on the 9th of July. It was done to accelerate political and social economic integration of the continent, which is absolutely necessary for further development in the region, promote and defend African common positions on issues of interest to the continent and its peoples, of course, achieve peace and security in Africa, and to promote democratic institutions good governance, and, of course, human rights. We also belong to COMESA, which is, again, another um, um, organization. The whole name is Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa. It promotes regional economic integration through trade and investment. With its 19 member states, it covers a population of uh, 430 million, if I take the figures of 2008 and an annual import bill of about $152 billion. Again, figures from 2008. We, of course, belong to the SADC, South African Development Community, which has a membership of 15 member states. It is The SADC is uh, one of the poorest regions in the world, despite being endowed with natural resources and a lot of natural resources. Approximately 45% of the total population lives on one dollar a day. And life expectancy has been declining over the time, so you can imagine how much work there is to be done here. Facing all this, I have, to, I have been told in documented that documented history has record, uh, recorded an estimated 300 years of known peace on our planet. 300 years sounds like a lot, leaving thousands of years open to conflicts of varying degrees, which means that we have been constantly involved in conflicts for thousands and thousands of years, be it religious, ethnic, territorial, or otherwise, between two or more groups on our planet on a constant basis. Interests are at stake, and war is one way of gaining with the consequences that we know that I do not have to describe to you, building up of society, building up of material loss, 
Mauritius itself has been the object for conflicts between powerful groups at the time, but it has never itself been involved in a conflict. It would have probably been erased from the map. As I told you, we do not have any kind of military um, equipment or people. This is just to show you broadly where we are and how small we are when you take a look at a map of the world. It is also interesting to know that the Western Indian Ocean has played a vital role in international politics. In ancient times, maritime commerce attracted numerous nations to the region, and it has not changed. I, have, uh, I am quite sure that the Indian Ocean will become the focus in time to come because of all the trade happening there, all what is at stake in the Indian Ocean, piracy, we know all about it, uh, as a, which makes it interesting for other powerful nations to be present in the in Indian Ocean. Um, the US itself is militarily present on the island of Diego Garcia. And during the Cold World War, the Cold Wars, consideration provoked competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. So becoming independent during the Cold War was a question of who you're going to side with. We never sided with anyone because we couldn't. And fortunately, and I think because of the understanding of our position, it was never taken against us that we never really sided with everyone because we were too small. Britain and France maintain a military and political presence in the region throughout much of the Cold War. After the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union, Moscow ended its military presence in the Western Indian Ocean. Uh, but as I said, uh, the US maintained its presence in the region. Um, this just to give us an idea, I thought I'd show you how much my predecessor, Ambassador Stelzer, was just saying, talking about the consequences of war, how much we spend on warfare, how much we spend on each soldier. And I just took it, I found it on the internet to tell you what are the, the 10 countries which are spending the most on warfare. The amount of money that is being spent, and of course, not less, the amount of people involved in warfare, in, uh, of course, in military organization of a country. This is, when you read this, of course, you, you, you Mauritius is only police. We don't even have an army, which comes to what my also my predecessor has already broached, the subject of the United Nations, which started as a League of Nations, and it was to avoid any future war, meaning that soft power is becoming more and more the the, the tool that can be used in order to thrive. Our destinies have become so closely connected that I don't think any nation can say that war is the best way of resolving a conflict or finding a solution. It is obvious that the future will lie in diplomacy, in soft power. And um, hard power, I believe, is not only war, but also showing what you have. I mean, have you ever ever asked yourself why when a, let's say, a president or anybody else from another country visits a country, the first thing is it'll be a military show uh, to welcome and to honor the guest. It is not only, it didn't start as being to honor or, or the guest or, or, or to welcome him, but it was also a show of what we can do, you know, this of our strength. It was a show of strength. And um, I think this show of strength is just to probably int intimidate, not to probably, it was to intimidate. And I think that this is going, I hope also that this is going to give way to soft power in the future. I don't have to tell you what the United Nations is about. My predecessor spoke a lot about it. There's a lot that ha needs to be done. Um, when he spoke about climate change, um, of course I obviously related myself to it, we are an island. And many people don't realize, someone was asking about uh, losing lives. There are 
islands like the Maldives are already saving money to move because very soon they won't exist if this goes on. Even if you keep the temperature rise at two degrees, I can tell you that a lot of coral reefs will die and uh, it will change the face of many islands here. My island's tourism relies a lot on coral reefs. We are almost surrounded by coral reefs, which makes swimming wi on our beaches, between the beach and the coral reef, it makes it a totally safe swimming place. The coral reef protects us from the, cyclic, the cyclones, which we get regularly. If all this goes, and a raise of temperature will kill the corals for a simple reason, that corals live in symbiosis with certain algae that needs light, needs oxygen, and the warmer the water, the warmer the sea, the less oxygen it can contain. I won't tell you the details, it goes into chemistry and biology, but the warmer the water, the less the oxygen, which means that the animals will not survive. So all this makes it more, more complex and more um, important than you might think. For, m for us in Mauritius and for other countries like the Maldives, it is a question of survival whether powerful countries get together, get their act together on this or not. Fortunately, we also have a seat in the United Nations. This is why we also team together with uh, organizations like AOSIS, which is an organization of, of, of island countries, small island states, uh, where we try to bring the balance into our, on our side when it comes to, to climate change. So we rely a lot on what happens between the powerful countries. And we hope that this picture will conclude what we want and that we can get together and speak about how to live together, to help each other, uh, so that we have a society which is going to be peaceful and advantageous to everyone else. Um, I would not, I'd like to, at this point, tell you, I just said that countries like Mauritius and other African countries rely a lot on help, on the help which we get from others. There are many organizations in Germany that do a lot to help African countries get their act together because we do not have the capacity, as I told you before. So this goes to our organization like Africa for Ein, SAFRI, um, and many other, Deutsche Afrika Stiftung, I there are many others that I would like to thank at this point, and I hope that um, this think tank we have here will come up with more solutions for the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yeah.